Chapman Cancer Center and the ACPNP Research Foundation virtual lecture. My name is Deborah Shelton, and I'm the medical liaison at the ACPNP Research Foundation. The foundation's mission is to fund promising research to find a cure for appendix cancer, PMP, and related peritoneal surface malignancies, and to fund educational programs for physicians and patients about these diseases. And that, of course, is what brings us all here today. Um, we are very pleased to have the privilege of hosting ACPNP's first CME accredited virtual lecture and to have the esteemed Dr. Chowdhury of the UPMC Hellman Cancer Center as our featured presenter. Dr. Chowdhury is going to be talking today, giving us updates on the surgical management of peritoneal surface malignancies. Dr. Chowdhury is an associate professor of surgery and surgical oncology and director of the David C. Cook Regional Perfusion Cancer Therapy Center at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Hellman Cancer Center. Dr. Chowdhury's clinical practice includes general surgical oncology and peritoneal surface malignancies. Dr. Chowdhury also has an NIH-funded basic science laboratory researching novel therapies for mucinous tumors. We are so grateful, Dr. Chowdhury, for your taking the time out of your beyond busy schedule um, to talk to us today. Before turning the mic over to you, I just have a couple of brief housekeeping announcements. So Dr. Chowdhury's presentation is going to be about 45 minutes uh, long, and we're hoping to have 10, 15 minutes afterwards for Q&A. Uh, audience members, you can submit your questions in writing, however, during Dr. Chowdhury's presentation. And to do that, you simply have to mouse across the bottom of your screen, and you should see um, the Q&A tab about halfway across. If you click on it, you should then get a text box that will open up, and you can just type your question right into that box and submit. And then what we'll do after Dr. Chowdhury's presentation has concluded, I'll pick back up and moderate the Q&A session. Um, we hope to get to as many questions as possible. Um, we'll just do the best we can do. Um, and then finally, um, as to the CM, CME credit paperwork, you should have gotten links to that and some of the reminder emails that went out before the lecture. You'll also get one after the lecture. And I believe um, right at the tail end of this, there should also be a link um, that you could access through the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, if all that fails, you can also just contact us at info at acpmp.org. That's info at acpmp.org. So that is more than enough for me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Chowdhury. Dr. Chowdhury, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining tonight. Uh, thank you to, the, to ACPMP for this uh, um, webinar tonight. Um, so, as mentioned, the uh, topic today is updates of the uh, of, surgic, of the uh, surgical management of peritoneal surface malignancies. Uh, obviously, this is a broad topic, and so what I'm going to try and do today is give you a, a overview of every of of this broad topic, and then maybe get into more specifics when we get to the Q and A. Um, the presentation outline tonight is, first of all, I'll define uh, peritoneal surface malignancy specifically from a surgeon's perspective. I'll define cytoreductive surgery, uh, hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemoperfusion, which is the main um, type of modality that we use for these tumors. I will then discuss concepts related to cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC for peritoneal surface malignancies. Uh, we'll talk about appropriate patient selection for cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. Uh, 
Uh, we'll then go into some of the clinical and oncologic outcomes data for these uh, diseases after uh, this surgical intervention. And finally, I'll touch on some of the novel uh, regional therapeutic approaches for peritoneal surface malignancy. So, so a, lot of, a lot of stuff to cover, and I'll try and um, go through this relatively quickly. So starting with the definitions, uh, peritoneal surface malignancies refer to tumors that are disseminated within and confined to the peritoneal lining of the abdominal cavity. And this is very important to uh, keep in mind. And this is what it can look like uh, on a CAT scan with all this hypodense material being uh, pseudomyxoma peritoni, and uh, it's basically uh, compressing all the bowel and the organs within the abdominal cavity. And this can be primary, pri per peritoneal surface mal malignancies can be primary, for example, me malignant uh, mesothelioma. And it can also be secondary, as in metastases from various organs like the colon or the stomach, uh, et cetera. Um, when we, in terms of defining cytoreductive surgery, it basically refers to surgically removing all macroscopic or visible disease from the abdominal cavity. And so the target here is all visible disease. And obviously that can entail a number of organ resections during the operation. And then the second component to this procedure during the same uh, operation after removing all the macroscopic disease, we place uh, large catheters and temperature pro probes into the abdominal cavity and we circulate heated chemotherapy, very high doses of chemotherapy through the abdominal cavity. And the target here is basically any residual microscopic disease that may be left behind. So going on to the rationale and concepts. So concept number one is that cytoreductive surgery is feasible because the abdominal cavity is enclosed by a natural barrier called the peritoneal membrane. And so if you look at this schematic on the left here, this purple line basically represents this peritoneal membrane. And the peritoneal membrane has a uh, parietal component to it, which is along the abdominal wall and the retroperitoneum and then a visceral component to it, which basically covers the abdominal organs on the inside. And so what you can see is that there is a cavity or the peritoneal cavity within the abdomen. And so when, a, when tumors rupture or have transmural invasion, they get into this peritoneal cavity and they can spread through the abdominal cavity. And obviously that's bad. However, from a surgeon's perspective, this peritoneal membrane gives us a surgical plane of dissection by which we can actually stay outside of this uh, membrane and do an oncologically sound resection to try and get all the disease out of the abdominal cavity. And so if you see this CAT scan on the right, you can see a lot of tumor, but in your mind's eye, you can try and you can perceive this peritoneal lining that is, that is basically surrounding uh, the abdominal organs. And the objective of our operation is to do an oncologically sound operation to get all this tumor out. So that peritoneal membrane has a number of important, uh, important um, part, uh, concepts to it. And so if you take that concept, patients who are not very good candidates for cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC are those who have extension outside of this membrane. So if you have a lot of disease that's extending into the retroperitoneum or into the abdominal wall or into the, into the vessels in the back or the lymph nodes or systemically into the liver or the lungs, and those are patients who are not good, good candidates for cytoreductive surgery in general. Uh, it's the patients who are confined to the peritoneal cavity that tend to do the best. Concept number two is that cytoreductive surgery involves a systematic and comprehensive removal of all visible disease. And so this is not a cherry picking operation. There are defined visceral resection and peritonectomy procedures that we follow in order to remove all the disease. And so this is just a picture of the right upper quadrant of the abdominal cavity. You can see all this, this millary uh, carcinomatosis that has spread uh, and is basically coating different organs. And this is what you want to achieve after the operation. We're basically stripped that peritoneal lining. So you see a nice clean duodenum, you see a nice clean kidney, retroperitoneum, the diaphragm back here, and the gerodes fascia, sorry, the uh, glissons uh, fascia over the liver has been uh, stripped. And so, yes, you're st we, there's still some disease on the gallbladder here, but what you want is a clean dissection of the entire peritoneum. Concept number three 
is that HIPEC is feasible because the peritoneal membrane or this barrier allows a very high doses of chemotherapy to be given into the abdomen without much systemic toxicity. And so the concept here is if you look at this patient who's been given intraperitoneal dose of mitomycin C, which is one of the drugs we use for HIPEC, the, the y-axis here shows the concentration of the drug. The x-axis here shows the, the duration of the um, drug in the peritoneal cavity up to 90 minutes. This solid line at the top shows you the concentration of mitomycin, which you can keep quite high during that 90 minute period whereas the solid line down here represents the concentration of mitomycin in the plasma. And so that obviously stays very low during the procedure. And then whatever drug does get into the systemic circulation is excreted through the urine. And so this is ideally what you wanna see, a high concentration in the peritoneum, a low concentration in the systemic circulation, and whatever does get in gets excreted. And so those are the types of drugs we use so that we can get maximum concentration of drug in the peritoneal cavity to have maximum cell kill. And that's allowed because we have this peritoneal membrane that uh, separates these compartments. Concept number four is that IP delivery or intraperitoneal delivery of drugs during HIPEC have limited tumor penetration and therefore it is essential to initially do cytoreductive surgery during these procedures. And so this is a uh, diagram on the left. Uh, this is an intraperitoneal uh, um, colon cancer uh, model in a, in a rat that has, been, that has been given either IP or IV uh, cisplatin. And so after sacrificing the rat, this is a nodule that is taken out in the, in the form of a pic picture. And schematically, this is the surface of the nodule and this is the depth of the nodule up to 2.5 millimeters. And this line is showing what happens to the concentration of the drug uh, during this, uh, after administration. And so you can see an exponential decrease in the concentration of the drug through the depth of the tumor over time. And this is because the drug either doesn't penetrate or it gets metabolized or it gets absorbed. And so you can see it doesn't penetrate too far, only up to about 2.5 or 2.25 millimeters. And so in this experiment, when they measured concentration of cisplatin, either when given IP or IV, you, the benefit of IP delivered cisplatin was only good up to about 2.25 millimeters. Uh, after that, there's really no benefit. And so that's the concept behind first having to cytoreduce patients. And that's why when we talk about as surgeons doing a complete cytoreduction or getting down to minimal disease or disease less than 2.5 millimeters, which is considered a CC1 resection, that is the concept that we want to get down to small nodules so that we can penetrate them with a very high dose of intraperitoneal drug. Concept number five is that heat is obviously kills cancer cells directly, but also augments chemotherapeutic effect. And that's why we use heat as a component of this therapy. And so obviously heat therapy has been around for generations to, ki to kill cancers and it's used in a variety of uh, different uh, cancers. And there's a lot of data for this. So this is in vitro data. It's a fibrosarcoma cell line exposed to cisplatin. And this is the fraction of cell kill on the y-axis, and here's the time duration on the x-axis. And what you see from a lot of this data is that obviously as you increase the temperature from 37 degrees to 42, 43 degrees centigrade, the amount of cell kill continues to increase. And so there's, you convert this from a, uh, from a reversible cell kill at lower temperatures to an irreversible cell kill at higher temperatures, usually around 42 to 43 degrees centigrade. But the other important thing to look at is that you have to have this exposure for a prolonged period of time. And that sweet spot is somewhere around 90 to 100 minutes. So you need to be exposing cells at a high temperature for a prolonged period of time in order to get uh, effective cell kill. And so that's the concept behind HIPEC where we, get, where we perfuse the abdominal cavity with drugs at about 42 degrees centigrade for about 100 minutes in our institution. Now this varies from institution to institution, but you want long temperatures, uh, long times. And this is important when we come to data down uh, in the latter part of this presentation, where in Europe, 
some of the recent trials have been at temperatures for at a much uh, lower duration or shorter duration, and we don't see the effect that we hope to see with these kinds of therapies. Concept number six is the impact of uncontrolled peritoneal metastases is severe and catastrophic. And this is something to keep in mind. Um, so if you think about a cancer that has spread, for example, to the liver or to the peritoneal cavity, and then the growth of this cancer over a period of months, a liver cancer, can, you can see, will grow, but not lead to necessarily to a significant uh, liver failure during this growth. The difference is in peritoneal spread of tumors, each nodule uh, gives off cancer cells and you end up with a diffuse peritoneal spread of tumors. And these tumors lead to uh, obstructive issues, uh, perforation issues, um, and so and ischemic issues. And so in the end, every the the the, uh, the small bowel and the organs uh, get so involved that at, that at this point, there's really no option for any therapy, whether it's systemic therapy or oral therapies, uh, because patients can't eat, they're in severe distress. And so getting control of the peritoneal disease early on is a very important factor. Concept number seven is that cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC can be performed with acceptable morbidity and mortality and with relatively good quality of life um, after these procedures. And this is not. Um, this is just to show a so the studies that have been done in multiple institutions. And on average, the uh, grade three or four morbidities or severe morbidities associated with these with these procedures is usually between twenty and thirty percent, with mortality rates of about of under five percent at high volume centers. And so this is no different to what you would see with other major operations, for example, esophagectomies or uh, pancreatic or duodenectomy. So even though there is a lot of discussion as to whether these procedures are too toxic, at high volume institutions, patients can get through these procedures uh, with a lot of care, and uh, but with a relatively low uh, mor mortality rates. So going on to the next portion of this is how do we, what are the uh, factors that we uh, keep in mind uh, in terms of appropriately selecting patients for cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. And this is determined by studies and by defining major prognostic variables uh, that affect survival uh, after these kinds of procedures. And so when we assess patients there, we obviously look at tumor-related factors. So things like the, the actual histology of the, uh, of the uh, tumor, the grade of the tumor, the peritoneal cancer index, which basically refers to the burden of disease within the abdominal cavity, uh, the lymph node status, and other factors that are tumor-related, as mentioned here. The other thing we look at is treatment-related factors. So how good a resection can we do? Can we get a complete macroscopic resection? Uh, can we minimize post-operative complications in patients? And what is their response to systemic chemotherapy prior to operating on patients? And finally, we look at patient-related factors, so performance status. Is the patient going to tolerate uh, the operation we're going to put them through. And so if you look at multiple studies, in general, you will find that certain histologies do better than others. For example, appendix cancers in general will do better than colon cancers. Lower grade histologies will in general do better than higher grade histologies. Lower amount of disease burden within the peritoneal cavity will generally do better than patients who have high volume of disease within the peritoneal cavity, so low volume here in blue and high volume here in brown. And patients who get a complete resection as shown in blue here will, all, will generally do better than patients who have an incomplete uh, uh, reduction. And so these are the main factors that predict or, uh, how patients will do uh, from these procedures. And then obviously you don't want to have extra peritoneal disease in general. And so when you're selecting patients, patients who have minimal disease, low-grade disease, certain histologies, we can get a complete resection, we minimize post-operative complications, are obviously going to do better than patients who don't have these factors. And so these are things that are very important to keep in mind uh, when selecting patients for these procedures. But obviously, no, even with these procedures that we're doing, there are flaws. Um, there is frequent peritoneal disease recurrence no matter what we do. 
significant morbidity of uh, site reductive surgery is a real issue, especially when it comes to recurrent disease. Uh, every time we have to go back in to repeat these procedures, the risk goes up. Um, systemic chemotherapy plays a very important role in these, in these diseases, of course, uh, but we do know that the effectiveness of systemic chemotherapy is, is less within the peritoneal cavity. It just doesn't get into the peritoneal cavity as well. There are limited targeted and novel therapies for such diseases, and diseases like pseudomyxoma peritoneae suffer from limited funding for drug development and research just because they are such rare diseases. But it's very important to remember that rare diseases may be rare, but rare disease patients are numerous. And so the fight and the research has to go on for these kinds of diseases. So what are the potential indications for site reductive surgery? Um, so there's a wide spectrum of uh, diseases for which we will use these, uh, this procedure. The, 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 the um, cancers for which it is considered standard and routine use uh, would be appendix cancers and, per and malignant peritoneal mesothelioma. The cancers for which there is more and more data to support its use, although there remains some contra con uh, controversy, are colorectal and ovarian cancer. And then the diseases for which it's still considered experimental and should not be used unless under protocols or clinical trials are diseases like gastric cancer or upper GI, uh, other upper GI cancers. So I'm going to focus on these diseases uh, one by one and go through some of the salient data for these or the more updated data for these. And I'll go through these relatively br briefly and maybe go into specifics in the question and answer time. So pseudomyxoma peritonei, just to get everyone uh, familiar, familiarized, pseudomyxoma character, uh, peritonei is characterized by mucinous societies and mucinous tumor nodules, which uh, spread and disseminate within the peritoneal cavity. They're almost exclusively arising from ruptured mucinous appendiceal neoplasms. And I've shown this a few times before, but this is what it can look like and cause significant problems with compression and compressive organ dysfunction uh, within the abdominal cavity. There's a natural history of progression. It usually starts as a dilation of the appendix, which gets filled with mucinous uh, material. They can be low-grade mucinous appendiceal neoplasms uh, called lamins or high-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasms or invasive mucinous adenocarcinomas. Eventually, these tumors rupture, leading to a spewing out of this gelatinous material, which then spreads within the abdominal cavity, and finally leads to what's called pseudomyxoma peritonei, where you have mucinous ascites and mucinous tumor nodules that coat the inter internal surface of the abdominal cavity. And there are, obviously, there are low grade and there are high grade varieties of these. This is just a general management uh, uh, algorithm for these kinds of tumors. It's important to know whether they're unruptured or ruptured. So if they're unruptured and they're low grade or high grade non-invasive mucinous neoplasms, an, app an appendectomy suffices. But once they become invasive mucinous adenocarcinomas, right hemicolectomies are generally warranted. For ruptured mucinous neoplasms of the appendix, there are again different varieties of it. If it's only acellular mucin, generally only within the uh, right lower quadrant with minimal disease, just uh, an appendectomy with scooping out of the mucin uh, is generally sufficient unless there's a lot of extracellular mucus. Once you have cellular mucus, uh, so what's called referred to as mucinous carcinoma peritonei grade one, a low grade uh, disease, in this case, site reductive surgery and HIPEC does become, is warranted, um, although an appendectomy will suffice given the lo low grade nature of this tumor. Once you're dealing with grade two and grade three mucinous carcinoma peritonei, site reductive surgery along with systemic chemotherapy is, that is used in these situations. But because of the higher grade um, nature of these tumors, right hemicolectomies are generally recommended uh, in, in this situation. So what are some of the outcomes? This is the data from our own, in, our own institution looking at uh, 20 years worth of uh, data for site reductive surgery and HIPEC for pseudomyxoma peritonei. The upper blue line represents the low-grade tumors. This is overall survival uh, over time. The blue line is the low-grade tumors. The red line is the intermediate or grade two tumors. And the green line is the high-grade G3 tumors. And you can see very promising data. 
especially for grade ones where our median survivals are over 10 years. For grade two tumors, the median survival is over five years. And for grade three tumors, we still struggle uh, with the early recurrence and not so good um, survival. The problem is on this right side here is the progression-free survival. Despite these surgeries, progression remains a problem. Even for low-grade tumors, you've, uh, the average progression occurs around five to seven years. And for grade twos and threes, it's usually around two years and one year. And so despite this um, effective therapy, we do suffer, uh, patients do suffer from uh, recurrent disease. Moving on to malignant peritoneal mesothelioma. So just uh, once again, a brief introduction. Um, so this is um, characterized by these um, uh, biocytes and white, whitish or black plaques or nodules that get disseminated within the peritoneal cavity. They often present with these, uh, with burden of disease shown here on this, uh, on this CAT scan. And there again, a variety of uh, histologic subtypes with epithelial being the intermediate subtype and sarcomatoid and biphasic undifferentiated being a much more aggressive uh, subtypes of these mesotheliomas. And then these two very rare borderline um, mesotheliomas, the well-differentiated and the multicystic, uh, which are, have an excellent progno prognosis. Site reductive surgery in HIPEC works very well for epithelio epithelioid. For the sarcomatoid and biphasic, we have to be very selective uh, because patients don't do as well. And for these other two rarer ones, we only use it generally in, in, terms, in cases where there's a lot of disease or recurrent disease. Looking at a, just uh, one study, this is a recent publication by Dr. Sugarbaker, a well-known uh, surgeon in site reductive surgery in HIPEC. This is a review from his institution over a couple of decades, looking at 129 patients with malignant peritoneal mesothelioma. These are, he, he highly selected his group, so only, he only selected patients with epithelioid, low-grade features, and completely resected tumors, and looked at sequential treatment over the 20 years. In the beginning, they were doing cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC. Later on, they added EPIC, which is early post-operative normothermic chemotherapy intraperitoneally. And then he added long-term intraperitoneal chemotherapy given for approximately six months. And this is the data just showing a graph for this uh, for survival. The top graph on the green is his most recent cohort showing excellent over 10-year survivals, whereas for the other two, it's still very decent survivals with median survivals around five years. And if you think back to the days where um, we were not operating on these patients, patients' median survivals were under a year with, uh, with non-operative therapy. So a lot of progress has been made in well-selected patients with malignant peritoneal mesothelioma. Moving on to patients with colorectal peritoneal metastases. Uh, this is just to, uh, I, I, uh, you all know this data very well, obviously, but just to show data for modern systemic chemotherapy, this is a, a publication using the RCAD database, which is a, a multi-institutional European database of first-line systemic chemotherapy in over 10,000 patients, divided it up into patients with only peritoneal metastases versus only liver metastases versus only lung metastases, and looking at survival with systemic first-line chemotherapy alone. And you can see two points from this. One, the survival for patients with peritoneal-only disease is not as good as for other sites of metastasis, suggesting the chemo does not work as well or doesn't penetrate as well. And number two, long-term survival remains an issue. We have made a lot of progress with improving median survival of patients on modern systemic chemotherapy, but long-term five-year survival still remains a challenge with systemic chemotherapy alone. So this is the recent Prodigy 7 study out of France, which was uh, discussed at the ASCO in 2018, has not, still, not yet been published, unfortunately. Uh, but this is the most recent randomized trial of site reduction versus site reduction plus HIPEC. So this is patients with peritoneal metastases from colon cancer, not a very highly selected group. So they had patients with disease burden up to 25, which is quite a lot of uh, disease, quite a high disease burden. It included patients who had resections up to less than a millimeter in size. All patients got six months of systemic chemotherapy. So either it was preoperative, postoperative, or both. And then they were randomized to either HIPEC uh, or site, uh, no HIPEC. So they all got site reduced, but half of them got HIPEC and half of them did not get HIPEC. 
it was a very well balanced group and the median PCI was 10. So again, a not a very highly selected group. And this is the data. Their median survival was 41 months in both cohorts and their five year survival is over 35% in both cohorts. There was a slightly higher or a significantly higher risk of um, complications, major complications in the HIPEC group and a longer length of stay. But the key message here is that even if you take out the HIPEC part of the procedure, site, uh, surgery seems to play a very important role in patients with, site with uh, colorectal peritoneal metastases with very decent long-term survival. Now, there are a lot of criticisms to the study, especially from here in the US, um, in terms of the HIPEC. Um, they use a HIPEC of oxaliplatin for only 30 minutes, and that's why when I showed you the concepts before, uh, preclinical data does not support using short periods of time. You need time of over 90 minutes at least to get uh, cell kill. And then there are a number of other uh, criticisms of, this, of the study, including whether overall survival is the right outcome to be measuring, whether oxaliplatin is the right drug to be used. And so there are criticisms, but obviously kudos to the group for getting such a trial done in, the, in Europe. Um, moving on to uh, high-risk patients. So this is the role of cytoreductive surgery for high-risk patients. In this study, uh, this is a, um, again, a study out of France called the Profilochip study, a phase three randomized trial. They define their high-risk group as patients with either minimal carcinomatosis at the time of diagnosis or surgery, or ovarian metastases only, or perforated colon cancers. And these patients, after having resections, got systemic chemotherapy for six months, and then if they had not recurred at a year, were randomized to either standard, standard arm, which is just surveillance, or to second look surgeries with cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. And their data is as follows. They found that 52% of the patients had recurrent disease, so high-risk patients. But it was a negative trial. Uh, at three years, the peritoneal relapse in the two arms was no different. So it was a negative study. We still don't know what the right answer is for high-risk patients. But again, some of the same criticisms come in. Uh, they again use high oxaliplatin for 30 minutes uh, in, this, uh, in this trial. Um, similarly, a second trial done in the Netherlands. Uh, this is the uh, Colopec trial, another phase three randomized trial, again in high-risk patients. They define their high-risk as patients with T4 disease and perforated cancers. And this was slightly different in that after resection and after, uh, sorry, at the time of diagnosis, patients either had, had standard resections or they got resection plus HIPEC. And then they, had their, they underwent adjuvant chemotherapy for six months and then had second look procedures at 18 months. So the data was again a negative trial. At 18 months, the peritoneal prolapse was no, uh, sorry, the peritoneal relapse uh, was no difference in the, no different in the two arms, suggesting that uh, proactive uh, cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC may not uh, be beneficial. Once again, this data has some of the same criticisms and so while we still don't know or don't have data to support this, um, doing site reductive surgery and HIPEC in a prophylactic setting, uh, the data is still out um, um, to some extent. Moving on to ovarian cancer, uh, just looking at a couple of re uh, more recent or updated trials that have been published. Uh, so this is the uh, trial out of Netherlands uh, by Dr. Van Driel in the group. Um, this is uh, 245 patients at stage three of epithelial ovarian cancer. The inclusion criteria for this study was um, uh, patients with had, that had high tumor burden who would normally be given neoadjuvant chemotherapy to reduce the, bur the burden of disease. And for patients who were taken for a cytoreductive procedure but were, uh, were, were unable to get a complete site reduction with residual tumors of greater than one centimeter. Those patients were then randomized to either were to perioperative uh, chemo, IV chemotherapy plus site reduction alone, or perioperative chemotherapy plus site reductive surgery plus HIPEC uh, with cisplatin. And the data shows a benefit to the add to the addition of HIPEC 
in this um, specific population of patients with an increase or an improvement in median progression-free survival, as well as an improvement in median overall survival uh, in, this, um, in this trial, comparing site reduction alone versus site reduction plus HIPEC. This is a bit of an older trial, but I put it up just because the trial I just mentioned from Netherlands was, in, was, was a more of a first-line approach. Uh, but this trial from Greece by Spiliotis and colleagues, this is another randomized phase three uh, trial of epithelial ovarian cancer, but in a recurrent uh, setting. So this included patients with recurrent epithelial ovarian cancer after having pre previously completed, uh, had, having had a complete response to primary therapy. Patients were again randomized to either site reduction IV chemotherapy or site reduction plus HIPEC and IV chemotherapy. And again, in this trial, they demonstrated an improve, improvement in median overall survival by adding HIPEC. And this was seen both in platinum sensitive as well as in platinum resistant uh, cohorts uh, within the study, suggesting that there may be a role for site reductive surgery and HIPEC in certain cohorts of patients or certain populations of patients uh, with ovarian cancer. Finally, moving on to gastric peritoneal metastases, where this is still considered experimental, but just to give you a sense for what data is out there, uh, this is multi-institutional data from, uh, again, from Europe. They have two, in France, they have two big, big um, groups. One is the RENAPE, which is the peritoneal surface on oncology group, and then Frank Frigat, which are the upper GI surgeons. So the upper GI surgeons do um, site reduction or resections without HIPEC, whereas the peritoneal group tend to use HIPEC as well. And so they basically compared their database. It's called a cytochip study. It was a propensity score matched comparative study. And they looked at the group that did site reduction alone versus site reduction plus, plus HIPEC plus, um, plus minus EPIC for gastric carcinomatosis. And they had inclusion criteria. They were had subgroups that had macroscopic disease versus uh, the groups that had just microscopic or cytology positive disease. And if you look at the data from uh, just comparing these two uh, databases, the patients who had site reductive surgery and HIPEC seemed to have a better outcome than patients who had site reduction alone, even though there was, there was quite a lot of difference in the, um, they were not well matched groups, uh, but this is propensity score matched uh, data. Finally, just to show you, there are two studies that are ongoing in gastric cancer. One is this Periscope 2 study out of Netherlands, which is looking at chemotherapy alone versus chemotherapy plus uh, site reductive surgery and HIPEC for relatively well-selected patients with gastric peritoneal carcinomatosis, so patients with a low burden of disease or cytology-only disease. And then a second study called the Gastropec study, which is not what, which will have much more advanced disease in it, looking at cytoreductive surgery versus cytoreductive surgery plus HIPEC in addition to systemic chemotherapy to look at the role for this, um, this procedure. But obviously these are all uh, ongoing and the data is awaited. Um, there is one more high, there is a high risk study being uh, going on as well. Uh, in patients with gastric cancer with, that are high risk. So these are again cytology positive or T3, T4 disease, N, N, N plus or N uh, lymph node positive disease. Again, comparing site reduction alone versus site reduction plus HIPEC. And that's another study that is eagerly awaited um, to see what these results show. Finally, in the last few minutes, uh, I'm going to move on uh, to some novel therapies that, uh, that are coming down the pike and to talk about some of the rationale uh, for these novel um, therapies and some of the clinical trials that are ongoing. The first one is, which relates to pseudomyxoma peritonei, is mucolytic therapy. So uh, as we mentioned in the past, in, previously these tumors are characterized by tons of uh, mucus or gel-like material that coats the, cell, the cancer cells, and the mucus it says, it itself causes a lot of compressive organ dysfunction but also the mucus protects the cancer cells by forming a barrier around them. This is what we see in the operating room where there's all this gel-like material. And you can imagine that under a microscope, electron microscope, it has a very small pore size. The pore size for this is in the, in the order of um, 50 to 200 nanometers. And so trying to get drugs into this can be a problem. Trying to break this up can be a problem. And so it, it's, a, it's a problematic disease. 
And so Dr. Morris in Australia and my lab here at the University of Pittsburgh have been looking at this mucolytic combination of bromelain and n cysteine Bromelain is a mucolytic uh, protease. It's a uh, extract from, uh, from pineapples. Uh, um, and sodium uh, and uh, n cysteine is a cysteine bond breaker. Uh, it's a, an extract from onions. So this combination breaks mucus because mucus is made up of cysteine bonds and made up of these glycolytic bonds and um, amide bonds. And so Dr. Morris ran this small 20 patient phase one pilot study in Australia, looking at direct injection of this combination into patients by putting a catheter into pockets of mucus and then directly instilling mucolytic therapy for 24 hours. And this is some of the data. This is a patient with PMP with a loculated mucus um, pocket in the pelvis uh, before therapy. And this is after therapy where it's reduced to about 50% in size. This is a second patient on the right, mucus in the abdominal wall of a patient, a catheter was placed, mucolytic therapy was given, and this is follow-up data showing pretty uh, very good resolution or dissolving uh, dissolution of the mucus, which can then be aspirated out through these catheters. And so same thing with uh, diffuse pseudomyxoma, a catheter placed in the abdominal cavity given mucolytic therapy. This is before therapy and after therapy where a lot of that mucinous material has gone away. And so there are two trials that are going to be opening here in the U.S. soon. One is Dr. Morris himself is going to open a, the similar trial of intraperitoneal and intratumoral short-term delivery of mucolytics. And this should be opening up in a month or two. And then I'll be opening up a phase one, two trial as well. Ours is slightly different. We're going to be giving long-term dwell therapy. So a, 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 a catheter in the, in the abdominal cavity and six weeks of uh, mucolytic therapy in patients to see how, they, uh, um, how well we can uh, treat these in a long-term uh, um, uh, therapy. And the idea here would be eventually to to dissolve the mucus so that we can improve the effect of standard therapies for these highly mucinous tumors. Moving on to uh, second novel therapies, molecular targeted therapies. There's a lot of genetic and molecular uh, data that's coming out for uh, mucinous tumors like pseudomyxoma peritonei and for other cancers. And just taking pseudomyxoma, we know that if you compare these mucinous tumors to standard colon or non-mucinous appendix cancers, they have a different uh, genetic makeup, different um, uh, pathways that are driving these mucinous tumors. And so can we target these, uh, these specific pathways or genetic abnormalities in order to improve our therapies? Um, and so currently there are a couple of trials for, um, for mucinous tumors that are open the MATCH trial and the My Pathway. These are basically sequencing the genetics of the of patient's tumors and then looking for specific target, targetable mutations uh, for which we may have drugs uh, and put patients on trial once they're failing other therapies. Moving on to immunotherapies. <clears throat> As we all know, this is not new to you, but we're trying to harness the patient's, uh, the patient's immune system to fight cancers. And if you look at these tumors, like appendix cancer, they are cold tumors. But when you look at them under a microscope, there's a lot of lymphocytes, but they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so can we harness these immune cells to fight the cancer for us? Obviously, as you know, there are, multi there are different ways of immunotherapy, immune checkpoints, oncolytic viral therapies, and adoptive cell therapies are the three major uh, arms of these. This is um, immune checkpoint modulation. As you know as well, uh, the immune system can be activated or inhibited by multiple different molecules and pathways. Um, some of the ones that we're all familiar with are T-cell activation inhibitors like CTLA-4 and PD-1, pd one and then activators like OX40. And so if we activate the activators or inhibit the inhibitors, we can improve the effects of immunotherapy. And so there are a couple of trials that are currently ongoing at the University of Pennsylvania. They're doing IV, IV therapy with uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 therapies in mucinous appendix and colon cancers, um, and it's an ongoing phase two trial. And similarly, through GSK, there is a phase one trial of ICOS uh, receptor uh, uh, agonist antibodies uh, or OX40 antibodies, along with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors 
uh, to try and boost the immune system and fight cancers. And so these are, I'm just putting up some of the trials that are ongoing that mostly relate to either mucinous appendix, pseudomyxoma, or colon cancers, since, that, uh, since um, given the venue we're talking at today. Moving on to adoptive cell therapy. This is, uh, as you know, re-engineering cytotoxic, cytotoxic T cells and giving them back to patients to more effectively kill cancers. So T cells from patients are taken out, they're re-engineered uh, with uh, receptors that can then target uh, cancers, uh, and then they're expanded and given back to patients. The, um, this is data from Dr. Katz, uh, well-known well in immunotherapy. Uh, he engineered this IP CAR T cell therapy targeting CEA. This is data from some of his mouse model. This is a mouse intraperitoneal colon cancer model. The left graph here looks at IV CAR T cell therapy versus control. And this most, uh, the one over here, uh, the third one is IP or intraperitoneal delivered CAR T therapy versus control. And you can see significant reduction in tumor burden in this, um, in this, in this uh, graph. And this, is, this graph basically shows the same data, but in the presence of uh, immune checkpoint block uh, inhibitors. And you can see significant reduction in tumor burden uh, as depicted here in the picture with very nice reduction in tumor burden uh, as shown over here. The other, um, Dr. Katz is running a phase one trial at the moment. Um, using this IP uh, intraperitoneal delivered CAR, CAR T cell therapy. And finally, I'm going to just show you data for oncolytic viral therapy. So oncolytic viral therapy is, has, been, or is, has been around uh, for a long time, uh, trying to um, either kill, cell, kill cancers directly or to harness the immune system. Um, this is data from Dr. Bartlett, uh, well known again in immunotherapy as well as in site reductive surgery and HIPEC. And he has developed this um, vaccinia virus that expresses a membrane-bound IL-2. This is data from his intraperitoneal colon cancer cell line, showing a control mice with intraperitoneal colon cancer versus treat, uh, mice treated with this vaccinia virus with IL-2, showing long-term survival in these mice. Another very exciting um, uh, data. Um, and this is the same data with uh, a checkpoint inhibitor showing almost cure in a lot, of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of mice, but obviously this is preclinical data. And we're gonna be opening a trial here in the next few months using this vaccinia virus uh, expressing membrane-bound IL-2. Uh, it'll be a, a phase one uh, dose escalation study uh, in patients with high risk or uh, high grade uh, intraperitoneal tumors. Um, I am gonna end there um, and so we can move on to questions. Um, Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Chowdhury, for a uh, very thoughtful, <laughs> informative presentation. Um, we do have questions. I love that you ended on the kind of very exciting therapeutic sort of approaches, and I think that's uplifting, at least from a certainly from a patient perspective, and I'm sure from a physician perspective as well. Um, we have a couple of questions about sort of the novel therapies. And so maybe since you ended your presentation there, we could begin our Q&A with that. Although one of the questions you actually fortuitously just answered because it was about your assessment of oncolytic virus therapy. So thank you for that. I think you must be a little bit of a um, uh, magician because you anticipated that in your presentation. Um, but we do have a couple more questions about novel therapies, at least one. Let's see, we have, do a quick time check. We have 11 minutes, so um, we'll just pick this one. But um, what are your current views of PIPAC? Um, we uh, at the ACPMP get questions about that from time to time too, and this was a question that someone in the audience has, but do you have any thoughts on PIPAC, the pressurized intraperitoneal chemotherapy as a treatment, um, particularly for patients with appendix cancer with perit peritoneal 
metastases? Sure, I'm going to go back so that since we have that question, I'll put this up so that everyone can see it while we talk. I missed it. But, okay. um, <laughs> so that, just so that everyone knows, so PIPEC is this pressurized intraperitoneal aerosolized chemotherapy. And so basically the concept behind this is that you aerosolize chemotherapeutic drugs and then you use laparoscopy to instill this in a aerosolized form under high pressure into the peritoneal cavity. And the concept behind this is that one, since it's aerosolized, the distribution of the drug through the abdominal, through the peritoneal cavity may be improved. And second, or secondly, or a few other things, since we're doing this under laparoscopic where we have pressure in the abdomen of 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury, we're in increasing that pressure. And we, so we may improve the penetration of the drug into the tumors uh, within, that are present within the peritoneal cavity. And so by doing this, we can give uh, lower doses potentially of the drugs, but have higher penetration and better uh, distribution of the drug. And then the final thing is repeatability, as in since we're doing this laparoscopically, we can do this multiple times. So as far as what's the data for this, things to keep in mind, one is that this is still considered experimental. Um, it is still in early phase clinical trials. And in general, it is still only used uh, as a last line of therapy uh, in, in trials uh, in patients who are not candidates or failed side reductive surgery or other therapies. So not prime time at the moment. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, my, as far as I am aware, it is not currently being used in the United States. And so all the trials and uh, the therapy and the research that has been do being done is mostly being done uh, abroad in various countries. Um, the, there is a lot of data for, uh, that's published on this. Um, as I said, I don't, it's not prime time yet. Uh, there is data supporting it, and there is data um, showing that the distribution may not be as good uh, as we may expect it to be, given that when we put the nozzle in the peritoneal cavity, most of the drug is delivered right along the trajectory of that novel and may not be getting distributed as well. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I think this is still, this still needs a lot more work and a lot more uh, research, uh, but the early phase trials are quite promising. They're showing some good survivals and good response rates, uh, but we need much more data to, to bring this um, into the clinic. Okay, excellent. And then um, looks like the questions, if I look at them and try to bucket them, we've got a couple sort of on patient kind of eligibility for CRS IPAC, and then maybe a couple more on what I would call sort of miscellaneous kind of treatment approaches. So let's try to do a quick lightning round, um, starting with the candidacy question. Um, for older patients, um, particularly someone, let's say, in their 80s, where there may be some age-related exclusion for treatment of peritoneal surface malignancies, um, do you have any thoughts, insight on how that patient could get access to some sort of other treatments, or might there be certain exceptions where they could still be eligible for, for CRS? IPAC, I don't know if that would be laparoscopically kind of palliative or something like that. I mean, what, what happens when you see patients that are, say, in their 80s or so and present with a peritoneal surface malignancy? So, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so, age is relative and, you know, obviously um, there are, you know, there, it's more than just age, as we all know. Um, it does depend on uh, other comorbidities and it is very patient dependent. So I, I, I never put age as the, as the only criterion, but obviously as surgeons, and especially when we're doing such um, uh, invasive and challenging operations on patients, age has to be kept in mind. The second thing I would say is that it is there are so many nuances to that uh, in terms of what is the what disease we're talking about, uh, 
um, what, so that we know what are the therapies are potentially there. Um, what is the extent of disease in this particular patient? If we're talking about minimal disease that requires a relatively small operation that may even be done laparoscopically, um, it, that may very well be the right thing to do. But if we're talking about a high-grade goblet cell carcinoma with extensive peritoneal disease, you know, then obviously that is not something we would put someone who's 80 years old through. Um, so I think it depends on how much disease we're talking about, what disease it is, um, because the treatment, uh, there are so many, as, as I showed you, there's colon and appendix and mesos and COVID. Uh, so it depends on what specific um, tumor we're talking about. So in the end, we have to, the, all these are very, these are nuanced and discussed in a tumor board setting, and then we decide what the risk versus benefit ratio uh, is, and then decide whether we should put patients through this operation or not. That's the best I can answer that without specifics of a case. Sure, absolutely. Um, good. And then what, so I, you know, I, I can't help by wordsmith, I'm a lawyer by training, but I noticed a couple times you were talking about generally what is a good patient eligible? So one of the questions um, that came in is, so what is the role for CRS HIPAC in the setting where there is extra peritoneal disease, but limited extra peritoneal disease? So for example, you know, a, a liver metastasis. Sure. So yes, this is um, always a challenging one and always something we discuss um, at tumor boards and as groups, but if there is, there is data that is published, um, both from our institution and from Europe, that in general, if you have limited extraperitoneal disease, so limited liver disease, however you, want to, however you want to define that, in these studies, ours was three or less tumors. In Europe, it was about the same three or less tumors, discrete tumors that don't require a major liver resection. Um, then the outcomes were similar um, in terms of uh, survival um, with and without liver metastases. So in general, if it is limited disease to the liver, which can be defined potentially as two or three no uh, tumor nodules that do not need a major liver resection, then the survivals are reasonable and the morbidity and mortality is not in increased significantly. And so we would potentially still um, consider those cases for site reductive surgery and HIPEC, but obviously we would also look at how they respond to systemic therapy first, make sure that they, they don't blossom on a period of systemic chemotherapy, um, and, and look at other factors like a disease-free interval um, uh, to make sure that we don't do a major operation and then three months later, you know, there's four other lesions in the liver. Uh, so it's not an absolute contraindication, but it is a relative contraindication. Okay. Okay, good. And I'm watching the time. We've got two minutes. We have more questions and we have minutes left. Um, so I do want to ask this one question because this was one of the questions that came in in advance of this um, webinar, and then it was raised again in the Q&A live. So I, I'd like to get to this. It's a pretty specific question. Um, more, I guess, about treatment approach or at least post-treatment approach. But do you have any thoughts on whether a patient who has been treated with HIPAC um, for PMP should avoid situations that could exacerbate hypoxia? Apparently, this question is coming from a 2016 paper that um, I believe you had co-authored, but I know that's a very specific question, so I don't know if there's time. Sorry, can you, can you, so avoid what did you say? Um, to, to avoid situations that could exacerbate hypoxia, particularly within the peritoneum. So the example given was a patient, you know, um, doing strenuous exercise at a high elevation. Apparently there's some suggestion that, um, with with 
um, mucin-2 secretion by a neoplastic goblet like cell in PMP, that that could be an adaptive mechanism oh, I see what you mean. Um, to support cell survival. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah that, that, uh, that's uh, preclinical data that we published from our lab, but does not translate into um, into any kind of um, situation where you need to avoid uh, potentially hypoxic, uh, hypoxic um, areas in a clinical setting from a patient standpoint. So no, okay. that's purely looking at um, basic science. What are the factors that can uh, affect mucus production? But it has no translation at the moment, at least uh, in patients. No. Great. Or no data that I can quote to you. Perfect. And then to end on a high note, back to novel therapeutic approaches, because as you know, the Research Foundation is certainly one of its core missions is to fund promising research to hopefully one day fund a cure for, for PMP and other peritoneal surface malignancies. So back to the BRONAC, um, do you have, are there early data that you could share um, on that? That was kind of one of the final questions that we got. Sure. So there is the phase one trial that Dr. Morris has published, and that is out in the literature. And anyone, you know, that is something that can definitely be looked at by uh, by folks. Um, we, my lab, I have preclinical data that is should be published within the next two months. It's in okay. review at the moment. Uh, so I have uh, data from my lab in animal models using the same. Um, the same uh, combination, but looking at the effect in combination with systemic therapies, showing that once you reduce that mucinous burden and then you add systemic cytotoxic agents, they are much more effective. Um, so that's data that will be coming out um, uh, very soon from our lab. Um, and so, yeah, uh, stay, stay tuned for that, yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, we are a couple minutes now beyond six o'clock, so I want to let you all go. But Dr. Chowdhury, we just all thank you very much for taking the time to come and, and do this presentation and answer some questions. Um, UPMC Home and Cancer Center, thank you. ACPMP Research Foundation, we're just so happy to have you and to have you as kind of our premier kickoff of, of the CME accredited uh, virtual webinars. Is, is, this is just wonderful. So thank you. If anyone has any questions about the ACPMP Research Foundation, you can find us on the website at www.acpmp.org, or you could reach out to us at info at acpmp.org. You should also have the link to the CME and um, just thank you very much, Dr. Chaudhry. I got to tell you one last quick thing on a personal note. Uh, when my spouse was first diagnosed with ACPMP a couple years ago, I had a flood of patients from the ACPMP Research Foundation, or at least those that are, you know, kind of follow on uh, Facebook and whatnot, reach out to me. And the very first patient that reached out to me was a former patient of yours who sang your praises then and sing your praises to this day. So thank you for all that you're doing on behalf of patients. Very, very kind of, kind of you. Thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you everyone for joining. I appreciate okay. it. Okay, thank you everybody.